Good Wednesday morning, and welcome to Ice Age TV, the Internal Combustion Engine Age TV YouTube channel narrative of cars and trucks and motorcycles, SUVs, dogs, silly conversations, all that stuff. Look at this. Got a little dusting, a little bit of snow here uh, last night on this cool February 1st. February 1st, wow. Wow, it's February. We've already gone through one month of the year. Old. Got my Elmer Fudd hat on. One of my subscribers said that I look like Elmer Fudd with my hat. I thought that was pretty funny, actually. <laughs> Where's that rabbit? Where's that rabbit? That little rascal. I got dogs as rabbits. Come on, pups. Yeah, I thought that was kind of entertaining. I get a kick out of the comments. I get, no, you stay around here. As usual, it's chase the dogs around the property before I start my YouTube channel. But look here. All the cars, all the different brand vehicles. What? How many different brand vehicles do I have? If you look here, I've got the Ford brand, the Jeep brand. I have the Ram, the Ram brand over here. I have inside the barn, come on, the Dodge brand, and I used to have the Toyota brand, the Toyota 4Runner. Hey, come on back, Scout, let's go, get in the office. So, and then if you go to my motorcycle brand, I've got the Harley brand, the Indian brand, and the Honda brand. So I've got multiple brands of products. Come on, let's go. And it's kind of weird yesterday, my, my voice didn't go with my, uh, the movement of my mouth didn't go with what I was saying. What's that all about? I don't know if it's at the upload, download. Come on, Scout! And so, anyways, what is the conversation today? I'm going to name it the brand conversation. What draws us as individuals to be married to a brand? Come on! Let's go! Come on, Scout! I mean, what is that all about? Where do we... Where do we kind of get the brand signature brand that we become loyal to and we'll argue for? We'll get the John Deere brand when I'm talking about tractors. I used to be a Kubota brand guy. Come on, Bob. Let's go. Come on. And so, come on, Scout. So, where does that all originate from? You know, where is where does the true beginnings of the brand that we become loyal to? I mean, for me, when I was a young kid, it was more of the, uh, come on, no. Get in, get in, the, get in the barn. Hey, look at this here. Look at this truck. Man, I tell you what, I just really do love my new truck. I really do. It is just such a uh, good overall versatile uh, vehicle for me. Really is kind of taking a little time out here in the, the conversations. And yeah, get my light on here. Get that on there. And yeah, this truck here, I just love it. I need to get my bed rug put in it. I need to get my uh, Tanu cover put on it. Come on, let's go. Nope, nope. Get up here. Just nope. You ain't doing that. So I just really love. I just like. It's just different. That's just who I am. People are already commenting that yeah, I'll be getting rid of that for the Ram TRX. And no, I wouldn't use that. If I'm gonna use the Ram TRX, I'm gonna use some other. You know, I got a whole deck of cards. That's always my saying. I've got a deck of cards. I got different vehicles, and. You know, would it be a ram for a ram? I think that would make more sense, right? All right, let's get upstairs here in the office. Cold morning. Cold morning. We really haven't had, since I've been back from Florida, really too bad a cold weather here in Northern Virginia, Maryland area. And really, barely even had my pool freeze, the pond freeze. It's cold up here. So let's get the, uh, the heat going, <laughs> get the crew in their places. Going and the adventure is going, and get my morning conversation in order here. Have everybody been mentioned how I changed up my uh, how I don't hold the phone the whole time? Watch all these guys that have the stick phone and they walk around and they hold it the whole time. They man, doesn't your arm, doesn't your arm <laughs> make you get kind of tired from that? I mean, sincerely. I mean, anybody out there does a YouTube and walks around with a phone in their hand, like Dan the Man out of California, that walks around 
hold his phone and there's a realtor guy in Miami, Florida that does the same thing and and they hold these phones, you know, out they're they're walking around like this. I just think, man, when you do this, you know, that gets old. Your shoulder and your arm. When but I wonder if they took a time out. You know what I mean? Unbeknownst they're cutting the video out and they take a, a break. What the hell is going on now? So here we are in the morning. Can't get my computer to open. There it is. I don't have to look at the uh, the morning. Where's my Ford Expedition? I know where that is. It's sitting at Coons Baltimore Ford. And, and that's what kind of made me think of the uh, conversation this morning of the brand recognition. Because I now, really now going on since the fall of 2017, I've been a Ford more loyal brand person. And prior to that, I was much more of the Chevy and Ram and Jeep um, and Dodge person. But really, from about 2010 through 2017, it had been more the Ram product and the Dodge product. Some Chevy, some of the Chevy product, but not much. Back in the back in the late 90s, definitely the Ram product and Chevy product. 2000 through 2008, 9, 10, that was definitely Chevy years. A lot of Chevys, a lot of Tahoes, Bourbons, Chevy 1500, 2500, 3500. And but also a lot of Rams as well, so a lot of Dodge and Ram, a lot of Chevy. Not I had one Ford, well, I actually had a few different Fords, but not many Fords at all. Just not, and then the 90s, I don't think I even owned a Ford, I don't think in, even the 80s. So I never came from the Ford, that isn't where I came from, you know. So the Ford product to be so dominant in my life now, that's really. That's it's kind of to me kind of unusual because I didn't grow up with my dad thinking that, that the Ford product was the better product. He thought General Motors was the better product, and Toyota. And I should also mention I was Toyota. I've always kind of been the Toyota guy. Back in the late '80s, I had a nice Toyota pickup truck, and then through the '90s, I had some nice Toyotas, and then through 2000 years, 2000 years, nothing really really sticks out. Well. I just had the Tacomas, not really, I think it was more like 2010, so that was 2,000 years, yeah, I'd have to say that not a lot of the Toyotas, even though I'm probably, Volkswagen, I had a lot of Volkswagens, late 90s Volkswagens through the 2,000 years Volkswagens, even up to about 2000, I'd say 18, I had a, Volt, a few Volkswagens, but it's been dominant now, so, so anyways, you know, the reason I'm talking about this is the Ford Expedition yesterday was an eye opener for me. And what I mean by that is, and I'm so, and I'm just, you know, what I say in my YouTube channel is the car gods. It just seems to be like I have the car gods because I've been so fortunate in my lifetime to own so many different vehicles and to really just have really nice vehicles for the most part. And I've had a lot of good luck with the cars. And, and you hear just really dad stories of people having cars or just give them never ending problems. Gotta have my coffee, a little flag here. So, the Ford Expedition really opened my eyes up yesterday that wow, that had it not been for me getting that new Ford Power Boost with the hybrid gas setup, that, that truck really has changed my view of the V6 Twin Turbo non-hybrid. And what I mean by that is that it's just so much more power, torque, and and so then that power boost has just really opened my eyes and how nice the Ford has done on their product, and it still has that Ford truck feel to it. Or it's had a nice Ram 1500 Limited, highest level you could get, airbag suspension. It had the, uh, I mean, it just had all every feature you could get in it. it didn't have adaptive cruise control or blue cruise. Oh, it's Super Cruise is the name of the General Motors product. So, anyways, the uh, the Ram fifteen hundred it, it just was too SUV like. It was too, it was too plush. It just didn't give that truck feel. That's why I got rid of it, and didn't get really great fuel mileage either. So, so for the Power Boost, the irony of me being in Baltimore, Maryland, Saturday, which I Saturday I was not planning to be in that area. That's just kind of like. When things happen, it's just weird on how that got drawn to that vehicle 
But that vehicle really saved me from being focused on buying that Ford Expedition I ordered last fall. Even though after I bought the Jeep Grand Cherokee L, I kind of pulled back and felt like that Expedition isn't going to be for the wife now. She has to greet Jeep Grand Cherokee L, and I'm not really sure where this is really going to go. But anyways, I ordered a nice vehicle for Coons Baltimore Ford. But after driving that vehicle, it really made me realize how the Ford Expedition is outdated. It really is. If you look at the Ford Expedition, when they redesigned it, and it came out in 2018, it was all redesigned fresh in 2018, I loved that vehicle because I had owned you know, recent Chevy Suburbans and Tahoes. And so I just thought Ford was a better vehicle at that time for the bang for the buck. Now, after driving it, no, I don't. I think Ford is behind. After driving that vehicle yesterday and now driving the Power Boost, that thing felt slow. It just it didn't have that pep to it. Um, the, the, the interior of the vehicle, the vehicle is just borderline outdated. So I'm not really excited about that vehicle. They're trying to get a deal done for me. And as a friend to them as a dealership, eh, it's something made sense. I'd evaluate it. But I would have to say the odds are that deal is not going to play out, and which isn't a big deal. The big deal is that for me, being very loyal to Ford and the brand, the power boost has kept me in the game to the point that I really have. And I talked about this in my video the other day when I was walking around looking at that truck on Saturday. I mean, I point blank said, I've had now like every Ford product. I've had the Expedition, I've had the Explorer, I've had the Focus, yes, RS Focus. I've had the uh, Edge, uh, the Maverick, um, the Ranger, the um, F-150, F-250, uh, F-350, F-450, Godzilla motor, diesel motor. And so I'm literally at the end with Ford of the brand excitement. I really am. I mean, I really, kind of yesterday, after I left that dealership, I was kind of like, you know, I think I'm really at the turning point. I think I'm, I mean, that's what happens to me. I'll be so into a brand product, and, and now, if you think about it, it's been five years. I'm really now five solid years of with the Ford brand and how I used to be with Ram. So for me, I, I could say to my, I can honestly say that through the right relationship, at Dulles Motor Cars, I can see me now transitioning back into the, uh, the the potential, the Ram product, the Jeep Wagoneer product. So I can see myself kind of just, I've had my day with Ford, and I think that the day has come where I just, I don't see how I'm going to be really overly excited to buy another Ford product because I got the Ford Bronco Raptor. I, ordered the, I had the Ford Bronco uh, Wild Tracks. I've got the Ford race truck. I've got the Ford GT500s. And so really at this stage, and I have the Ford Mustang Mach-E GT electric vehicle, and I have the Ford Lightning truck. So at this point, what have I not owned with Ford besides the Ford's GT? And I'm not getting that vehicle. So, yeah, I think for my brand loyalty, I'd have to say it, 2023 could be a transition away from Ford. I mean, I can honestly say it. Does that mean I'm selling all my Ford products? No. It means more, do I continue to pursue buying more Ford products? I'd have to say that the odds are I won't. And be like, what's the Ford Raptor R? There's no way I'm buying that truck. It's just too expensive. I mean, the only way I would buy that truck, I mean, okay, give, give me $200,000 for my Ford Heritage Mustang GT500. Yeah, okay, I'll buy a Raptor. All right, yeah, I'll do that. That's fine. But they're not going to do that. Yesterday's conversation was very disappointing. The key guys in dealership were telling me the GT500 Heritage Edition I, that I paid, you know, in my eyes, premium price because I paid ADM on it, not radical. But their position is it's not the car that people are looking for at this time. That's kind of hard to believe. And then even my Hellcats, they were kind of like, yeah, you know, I'm just thinking, wow, you guys, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. My attitude is like, is, is this the, you know, try to take my car for nothing so you can sell it for everything? Borderline, that's kind of the way I felt, really, sadly, but I don't know. So, so yeah, so brain recognition. You know, what, what drives you as an individual for the a, a specific model brand? And in the arguments, like when I'd be in the Dodge Hellcat forum, in the uh, car community, everybody would, not everybody, but a majority in that forum would be like Ford. They don't like Ford. You know, they would mock the Fords. 
And for me, it was entertainment to have fun and showing how I'm buying Fords in a Dodge Forum. And, you know, and those others were kind of like, yeah, pretty cool. I like it. And, you know, so it was, but it was just, the, it's just the, the jab because people that are in the Dodge Forum are Dodge brand loyal people. And so when you bring in the Ford conversation, then you get all the Ford, you know, making fun of the Ford. And, but what drives that? You know, so what, what experience do you have? And I think what, I think what happens is if you buy a Dodge and have a really bad uh, experience with it, you'll probably never buy a Dodge again. So you're immediately not, no longer, you're not a Dodge brand person. If you buy a Ford, same thing. You have a bad experience then you're not going to be a Ford brand person. But on the other hand, if you buy a Ford and it's the best car you've ever owned, you'll be on the page that this is the best brand and blah, 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 and you'll be a branded person for Ford or Dodge or Chevy or less goes on. But what drives that? You know, what drives a person that feels that his Toyota Tundra pickup truck is better than my Ford F-150 truck? And, again, and the first thing you hear is, oh, the Tundra will drive further, go further, but it's better built, blah, blah. And I don't know about that. I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah okay. But my experience has been with Toyota Tundra. It's not a truck to work out of. And I'd be very disappointed. I've had many Tundras. And, in fact, last fall I tried to buy a Tundra. I mean, I've been with Toyota Financial for 40 years. And they would not loan me money to buy a Toyota truck. I was blown away. Never, ever harmed Toyota Financial financially. Loyal to them through the toughest times. It didn't, didn't, uh, you know, do bad to them when the top, my times were the worst in my life. Numerous times I've owned Toyota products and never and always fought as hard as I could to make things work. And nothing. But the Tundra, I mean, I was intrigued by Tundra, but the Tundra does not get very good reviews. If you read the, the automotive, you know, digital world of information, uh, you'll see that the Tundra doesn't get really that good a review. I mean, it, it, the com comments are underpowered, floats. I'm not talking about the Charity Pro. I'm talking about the Tundra truck. It's And so you hear, you know, underpowered, bad fuel economy. The truck seems kind of heavy. doesn't really go through the corners. Uh, the, you know, it just doesn't get rave reviews. But the Toyota dealers around where I live, their, their attitude is be so lucky to get one, and you're going to pay 20, 30 grand more to, to even get one. Psh, yeah, right. But once again, I tried. I tried, I tried to, uh, to buy one last fall, but they couldn't. It was really nice. It was a real intermediate package. It looked good, and I really wanted to get one to really see the truce. But I couldn't, so I didn't. So anyways, for me, my initial Toyota love started when I was just a kid. I can still remember going to a Toyota dealership in 1973 with my father in Walnut Creek, California, and I can remember going to a Twitter dealership and a Mazda dealership right next to each other. And I, just as a little kid, could tell the difference of the Toyota quality versus the Mazda not-so-great quality. And, and I just loved the little Toyota pickup they, they had at that time. We Actually, my dad actually bought a used one. And actually, I, I learned how to drive a stick shift truck in that little Toyota pickup truck my dad bought. That was like in 1975. He would let me, and at that age, so I would have been, I guess, 12 years old. I was 12 years old, and my dad let me drive that truck up and down the street. And that's really where I learned my first, you know, experience of driving a stick shift vehicle. So, I just really liked the Toyota product. That experience, me driving a little truck, just had me learn. I liked the way they looked when they came out with the first little four-wheel drive, two-door trucks. I can still remember the yellow Toyota truck. This is back like in 1982, 1980, and just the coolest like, little four-wheel drive truck. And I really wanted one of those. But those things weren't cheap. And then Chevy. I remember going to a, to a, a, a used car dealership and seeing the Chevy pickup truck, two-door, uh, two-wheel drive, step side, silver, with really cool, like the fin type of uh, wheels on it, just a really cool looking Chevy, the California style Chevy truck. And oh my dad to buy it so bad and he just couldn't he just couldn't afford it. He couldn't couldn't get the deal to work. So then that was kind of the Chevy. Uh, you know, my dad was a Pontiac guy and a Cadillac guy. So we we're kind of a GM family. And then the Datsun, the Datsun 280Z. Oh my gosh, I remember seeing a Datsun 260Z in the showroom in, in California. 
you know, I thought that thing was so cool. My dad got one of those. So I was, I was kind of a, never was a big Nissan person, but I like the Datsun 280Z. But I never really had the Nissan product. And then in 1982, I bought one of the first Volkswagen GTIs that came to this country. And I actually worked at a Volkswagen dealership for a short time in my life. At a, in the parts, the parts end, and the, the parts service end where I was helping the guys get the parts for the work on the cars and the front end too in Fairfax Volkswagen here in Fairfax, Virginia, Fairfax City. And so I did that stint, but I was kind of a Volkswagen guy. I always kind of like, I used to have back in the late 90s the Volkswagen Gas. No, I had the Volkswagen TDIs. And had, so I had the Volkswagen Golf and the Volkswagen uh, Beetle. And so I always liked the Volkswagen. Then I owned some of the uh, Touregs, Volkswagen Touregs. And in just a few years back, I just bought, I had a deal done on a Volkswagen GTI R here locally before I bought that Honda Civic Type R. And I kind of came to closure the Civic Type R was the better package, better deal. So I went with the Civic R. Plus, so that's my daughter liked that look over the, uh, the, G, the GTI square look. So, so for me, I was exposed to a lot of different brands. You know, and I just, and I did, I bought a lot of different brands. And then when Dodge revamped the uh, the Ram 1500 back in like 1993 or 92, oh, I really wanted one of those. But it wasn't until like 1996, financially, I was able to actually get one of those. And so, and then, but I was jumping back between the Chevys and the Toyota 4Runner, the Toyota Cressida. I mean, I just go through the list of vehicles. Mazda, I had a Mazda. I ended up buying a Mazda RX-7. Uh, 10th anniversary edition. So for me, my brand rec, my, the brand loyalty for me, it's kind of been all over the place. So I've, I have really have jumped from one manufacturer to another, and but it's been kind of consistent being the Toyota brand most of my life. I kind of kept the Volkswagen product, you know, throughout my old my older years, of my life once I kind of get going, my career going. And, and then General Motors, but Corvettes, I've had like five Corvettes, and I had a Camaro, didn't keep it very long, it was like 1970, like a 1980 Camaro or something, like 78 Camaro, I can't even remember, gave it to my sister, I drove it for like three or four months, and then I was like, I'm bored of this thing, so my sister drove it, oh, I had, I had the Chevy SS Monte Carlo, same thing, I drove it for like six months and gave it to my sister, what I mean by that is she started making the payments instead of me making the payments, all right. So what is the uh, so what you know so for me the the brand the brand recognition in, you know, in some ways my father was there because of General Motors but then the Mopar side came from me always wanting the uh, Ram Power Wagon oh my gosh I remember so 1970 the the uh, winter of 78 1978 I so remember getting my dad to drive to a Dodge Ram dealership. And we looked at a red and black power wagon. And oh, one of my dad's so bad to buy that truck. And it was just a little out of his price range. I think it was like $7,800. And he was more on the, on the five dollars $6,000 range. And so he just, he just didn't, he couldn't commit to that. So we ordered a 1978 Chevy K1500 um, two door, which that's all it really was back then, step side Chevy truck. We factory ordered in January. It didn't even come in until like June. So, so for the the GM side, it was really more GM side for my father. For the most part, it was always GMs and a little bit of foreign cars, not much. And so then for me, 1982, 83, I bought my first Mopar, 1971 used uh, Cuda, 340, four speed pistol grip, and and that was one of my Back over here, straight over here, I'll show it to you. If you've got anybody watching my channel, I'm going to go over there just to kind of show it to you so you can see it here and see here. So, this was my first car that I actually ever purchased, right here. Okay, can you kind of see that? Yeah, that was, man, I wish I would have kept that car. <laughs> and then, I had a Chevy uh, lifted uh, K10. That was like a 1980 or 81. The 305 motor in it. So brain recognition. What? What? So what? You know. So for me, on my own, I was always the truck guy. My family really wasn't. I was more the truck guy growing up. Converted my brother to be kind of a truck guy. 
So, all right, anyways, I just wanted to share my own stories of, for me, you know, what drives you to your brand recognition? Be kind of curious, somebody else out there on my channel, you know, say, yeah, my, when I was young, my dad always owned this, and I just kind of fell in love with it, or my neighbor had this, or somebody, or my brother, you know, I think we all have influence, and for me, I was always in the car magazines, always reading about the latest, greatest, and this and that, and so, what, you know, what, what gets us to become loyal to a brand product and i mean it's a no-brainer when you buy a specific brand and it's very good to you the cars are reliable it rides nice and it just is a really good package and that just starts the the relationship of you know what what keeps you loyal to the brand and or you're not loyal to the brand at all because the car has been a, nothing but a, a problem trouble so i think of that and the car the car thing so then I think to myself, what, how do we become brand, uh, how do we become branded? I mean, we're allowing we become branded in some ways of you choosing your political party. What drives us to have the, our differences on why you support one policy and administration over another? And that's where it's so, we have our car conversations and we all can see our differences and try to be understanding and not too much of a jerk on why somebody likes Chevy more than Ford or Ford is Chevy. I mean, yeah, it can get, it can get the hate thing going, but anyways, so what, you know, what, what are the, what's the environment that creates us to have the divisions of what we think's right versus wrong? You know, we support one party that believes is right versus another party that believes is wrong. I mean, what drives that? Where is that, you know, where is the, where does that all originate from? Is that from the upbringing of our parents? You know, I mean, I would have to say to a degree, but I hear many stories of, of people that have parents who are totally opposite of their political views and ideas than they are. I mean, so there's many of those stories. So is that, is that factual? Is it the content that you read? Is it what's being taught to you in school? I mean, more than ever, all the conversation is, if you go to college, the odds are that the uh, the liberal uh, agenda in the liberal professor will be, you know, probably more so than a conservative. I've been told by some people that, you know, if you're a conservative individual and you go apply for a job today to be a professor in a college, you won't get the job. That's I mean, do I know that factually? I don't. I mean, I wouldn't say that would be if he's going to the Christian school or certain, you know, uh, domination of a, a religious school, maybe. But, yeah, so then here's what's really interesting here with Elon Musk. It's Elon Musk, never-ending conversations. Well, get this. It's Baker and, what's it, Roth and Gabba or somebody that's going to be downtown in the House Oversight Committee testifying in front of Congress about um, these three Twitter employees that participated with the FBI of covering up the, uh, the Hunter Biden uh, Barissa stories of Joe Biden possibly being part of a you know, part of foreign monies of dealings in 2015 with other governments of enriching himself and his son. Yeah, so that they're going to be in front of the Congress testifying of what they uh, were told by the FBI and how to handle the Twitter accounts and what could be shown and what couldn't be shown. And the reason I bring that up is Elon Musk is being called out by the European Union for the uh, the new Digital Service Act and the, digital, the new Digital Market, I think Market Act. So it's DSA and DMA. It's a bill that was introduced in the European Union like back in 2020, I believe. And they finally have come to resolution and come to uh, the bill to be uh, enacted that apparently I think this year or maybe February of 2024, not real clear on that, but the bill is basically really um, targeting more than ever the Internet of the internet age of what the likes of Twitter did to uh, cover up information and disinformation. And so that's what this new bill in the European Union is all about. It's really wanting to uh, have more 
I guess you could say, control of uh, what's going on in the, uh, the Wild West uh, internet world where it's a free-for-all of people doing devious things to others and misleading uh, people and, and misinformation and governing bodies and businesses deliberately take your information and then they and they steal your identity and, and they have misinformation and they have an agenda and so very interesting but they're they're telling Elon Musk that apparently he's really on the radar screen because of what he's uncovered with the Twitter files so apparently I guess if you uh, don't abide by these new guidelines and rules you can look it all up on the internet it kind of gets a little radical, I guess, with fines and and what they, I mean, I don't really know what the, the end implications are. And so that's interesting. I mean, that's very interesting. And the reason I bring that up when the brand, you know, conversations of the car is that it seems like you have the brand followers of Facebook, you have the Twitter, you have the Reddit. You have different social platforms, which for the most part I never really have interacted with. I haven't, and even on me on Twitter, it's just uh, it's just it's just. I mean, I don't know how people are really. I just I don't know. I it's just to me it's a depressing environment. You get on you get on the Twitter. What's enlightening on that thing besides just the never ending belittling of others, and and then the new tie. The, the black guy that just got killed in Memphis, Tennessee, by the police, and there's going to be a funeral today on that, which uh, you know, just sad that that has, has to happen. And then how does the you know how does the social media handle that? That then gets you know that goes from the internet and it goes to the streets. It's, I I talked about this. If you go and you look at my morning conversations, I talked months ago about how. Now the House committee would be GOP controlled. That just give it some time, and the good old BLM and the good old media machines and ratchet up the hate the police, the race, everything else. So you know that's it's all going to start to play out. Unfortunately, sadly, the the burning of the buildings in the streets and the violence in the streets. It's right around the corner. It's going to be the uh, springtime summer festivities. It's Antifa. It's all going to start happening. And then you'll hear the never-ending, you know, hate of the Republican Party. Like, you don't hear about the Democratic Party either. But, but yeah, but so, it's, and then this country has the digital, they have, it's not being governed per se. I think it's more of a proactive, the digital world sees this country. They need to try to get their act together more before the governing bodies do try to control it more. But, boy, not covering the governing body of this country. Oh, the Biden administration was really back in February this past, of last year praising the, uh, the uh, EU, the European Union, for the Digital uh, Services Act. They were really jumping up and down. That Yeah, yeah, you need to really get into these social media things and control with these, you know, and, and, or monitor all this disinformation. <laughs> Yeah, the guy, yeah, the guy that's all part of that, that, you know, basically his party supported all that type of stuff to happen. COVID, it, goes, it gets deep. I'm not going there. We're out of time. It's 33 minutes into this morning branding conversation. But anyways, I thought I'd share with you my my thoughts on how I became brand. You know, I guess you'd be a traitor to some. Like, yeah, but you get all that brand. And then you just, you can ask people to know me. They witnessed me having all Jeeps and Rams and Dodges. And from 2017 to 2018, it went from that to having all Fords. Yeah, no lie. My whole driveway, if I, if I want to do all the edit, the content, I could be showing you pictures right now of the years 2014, 15, 16, 17, into 18. And you'd see how everything went from being basically all Jeep and Dodge and Ram to it all being Ford. You would actually see the transition of the, the pictures of, of what I had to what I went to. So anyways, what made you become the political party? And a lot of people today would be like, you know what? I'm independent or eh, I don't want to be involved in all that. You know, I get all that. Whatever. Whatever works for you. But I just am interested to see what other people say. Is The brand recognition. What's your favorite brand? What made you you know, go to that brand, and then why did you, you know, what, what's your, 
political party uh, favorite, or maybe you don't want to say you have a favorite one. Which one? Which one you hate the most, right? <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I'm not here to promote the hate. That's not my goal. So everybody, thanks for watching. What's going on today? I really want to get the truck windows tinted. I need to put the truck bed back together. That's for sure. I want to get some miles on it because I really want to do a tow video on that truck and really start seeing the uh, the real deal on that towing capability in that truck. And I think you should wait to get like a thousand miles on it. If I can just run up down to where I've been going the last few days, I'll have a thousand miles on it. So anyways, everybody, thank you so much for uh, really nice comments, really great support. You know, I know me watch my channel. This guy's crazy. Yeah, I am. I mean, I don't, I don't deny it. You're, you're a car addict. Yeah, okay, well, right. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I'm not going to mislead anybody on that. That's who I am. I know. Challenges in life. Everybody has them. So, uh, the Elmer Fudd look. I need to go out and chase a rabbit. Get my shotgun out. Nah, I ain't going to shoot no rabbit. I'm going to chase him around and look goofy like Mr. Elmer Fudd, right? <laughs> Hey, everybody, thanks for watching. God bless. Stay safe and stay tuned. What's the next adventure, right? You never know with me.